Yeah, we're good. Thank you for joining us with Mox in Motion with Joe Dorsey. Hello, everybody. Welcome to our first episode of Mox in Motion. I uh, appreciate each one of you tuning in and learning a little bit more about the Lego Technics side of things. We have uh, David here with us. Want we'll to say hi? How you guys doing, everybody? This is going to be our intro class, like I was discussing uh, in the past few videos. Very cool. So uh, I thought a really good place for us to start out would be kind of discussing the elements that kind of make up the Lego Technic side of things. So I went through my parts bin and I pulled out what I felt was probably about 80% of the Technic things that I use on a regular basis and a regular build. And I wanted to talk with you guys about them so you can kind of see what, what they are, share their nomenclature, how we identify them, and then talk about some of the specifics of them because a lot of the parts look very similar to each other as they're kind of laying out here. Uh, but they do very different things and they're used for different reasons. So we're gonna take a little bit of time and kind of go through that. And uh, given on how much time we have at the end after going through that, we'll show some builds and kind of talk about what they are doing and how it's kind of put together in the hopes that eventually you guys will be able to incorporate some of these things into your own builds and adding motion into some of the mocks that you're creating. Yeah, so it's gonna be a really fun class um, or classes essentially. We have all these different parts as Joe said, so we're gonna be able to show off so much different motion, articulation, et cetera, how some of these parts really work together and separately. And then Joe has quite a bit of stuff built or ready to show you. Yeah, we've got some little mock-ups, some different things. We've got motors, gears, bricks, beams, pins, axles, all the good stuff. It's got a whole like remote system here Infrared. too. Infrared, we got it all. So we'll get to talk to you a little bit about it. I'll tell you what I know about it off the top of my head, uh, kind of like when it was introduced or when it went through a change. There's some things that are color specific and some things that the color doesn't really matter. They just make them in different colors. So we'll kind of talk about that. Uh, let's go ahead. We'll start talking with pins and axles. Then we'll move over to beams and bricks, gears, and then some of the noodles and different things that we use as we're building to help everybody out. Sound yes. good? And in yeah. the meantime, if you guys ever uh, have any questions at all, please feel free to either enter them in the chat. Uh, we also sent out a link to join us live, um, if you wish, on Facebook and Instagram. So if you guys would like to join us live, uh, please click on those. If you guys have any questions at all, please just go ahead and enter them into the chat and we'll get them relayed over to uh, Joe and David over at the table. Perfect. All right, so let's get started. We'll talk about the pin. This is the guy. He's the one. Like when you think Technic, that's the element right there. So that one little pin, just very simple little thing, is the majority of the build. So when you get a Technic set, it'll be like a thousand pieces, but usually like a tenth to twentieth of that is going to be just this one part because this is the most important crucial right part. and that technic pin comes in almost like every set like yep almost every set uses a, a, a nice little handful or more and you always get an extra piece like yeah that. they throw some more of them in there because they they go missing <laughs> right they go missing or they break if you're you know putting a lot of pressure into the build um, and they come in different sizes and they're a couple different types right yeah so the majority of them you know this guy right here is black and the other uh, common color that you're gonna find is the gray. So both of these are, well, what do you think? Both of these are equal in size, but if you guys look close, you could see a couple little differences between the two pins. Yeah, right here on the edges, I mean, it's so tiny. I would, I would you'd have to go and, and take a look in your own parts bin to kind of see, but this one is used when you're holding things together and you don't want them to move at all. So this one has built-in friction in the pin, whereas this one over here does not. So an example of that, let's just grab a, we'll grab a little gear here. If I put a gear on this end, on the gray pin, it's able to spin very freely, right. as opposed to with the black pin, whenever you do that, it introduces a lot of friction and it's it doesn't want to spin at all. So it'll still rotate, but it'll hold more yeah it'll hold it together so there's a specific reason this one is really common this one is a little, a little bit more less common so that's why that's the purpose between them so these are just your standard two long pins two long meaning it's two studs across from there you're going to move into your three pin this is the most common one that you're going to see and it comes in a couple of other colors it also comes in black but this is a friction three long pin 
So it gives you the ability to have one brick on one side and two bricks on the other. Do you want to explain to them what you mean by stud length too? Yeah. So we'll grab a, we'll just grab this big honking piece over here. So it's the length of it. So if you can kind of compare in its length, so it lines up three studs. Yeah. So everybody could see that it's two studs. one, two, and incorporates the space in between the studs given the size of the pins. Exactly. So this one also comes in a variant where there's frictionless. In the newer sets, they've kind of stuck with tan as the normal color that they do for frictionless. In the older sets, it's gonna be that light gray or light bluish gray. So same thing here. If you need something that rotates, but say it's got more weight on it, you could put this in too, too deep. It'll have a lot more rigidity whenever you have something rotating on the end. And then the other variant of that, that's a three long that I, I like to talk is a, it's a two, it's a three long pin, but it's got a bushing on the end. And that's used for another type, which are yep. called axles. Axles. So you could introduce an axle there. So we'll go right into that. Axle pins, same type of nomenclature. It's a two long axle pin. This one is blue. It also comes in black and a few other colors, but those ones are all friction. And then same thing for the non-friction. You have tan. And you also have the older style. Old light bluish gray. gray. Yeah, light gray or light bluish gray, depending on the age. Yes. So there's that. A couple others that you're going to see. These are some newer pieces introduced probably three or four years ago. This is a combination of a three long, and it's got two pins and one axle. And then Lego was kind enough to give us the reverse of that, where it's a one pin and a two long axle. Right. Creating different types of play in uh a lot of grip too because mm -hmm. the the dark bluish gray pin still has a few little notches on it mm -hmm. to create friction yeah both of these guys have friction in them they haven't made a non-friction and the main reason that they haven't is because the majority of the applications you could just use a simple axle or a pin it's very rare where you would need one axle pin these parts are used a lot of builds whenever you're connecting beams uh that have axle holes in them so that's where you would use something like this. We'll talk about these in just a moment. All right. So a couple of other pins that you need to know about. You have the kind of studded pin. It's a very short pin on one side with just a stud on the other side. And then you have the one and a half long pin. And these ones are all frictionless. And these are important to use whenever you're going with a half, half wide beam as opposed to a standard beam. So you could put those in there and make your music maker, whatever it may be that you got going on. <laughs> All right, so that's the majority for the pins. You have just straight pins, axle pins, and now we're going to move into the axles. So the axles start at two long, and they go all the way up to a 12 long, and there's even a 32 long or one really long one. Uh, those are kind of rare. They're not in a lot of sets. Um, we'll start off with the two long. They come in two major colors, red and black. Uh, somewhere in the 2000s, Lego decided to switch up the colors a little bit to make it easier because everything was black. All the axles used to be black. Right. Uh, but now they kind of switched them up a little bit. So the two long axles are in red for the most part. You can find them in black in a few sets here and there. And the, the black ones originally used to come with no little cuts in them, right? Yeah, they, uh, they went through another variant even in the older stuff like pre-88, I think. Uh, where it was just an axle and those ones were kind of tough to use there wasn't enough friction on them right so when you're putting a bushing on the end of it it would just fall off slide right yeah, off so that one little cut at the end kind of helps it hold it together and that's the only only axle that has that little cut on the other axles like this is a three long and as you can see it's gray so for everything here on out gray means it's an odd length and black means that it's a even length um but in the older sets, they did have three long and black. So you got to be careful when you're sorting through your parts. You might find one that's a a, a black, but it's an even. Oh, yeah. We can put it. Does that help out a little bit? We'll put them on the table. Yeah, perfect. We'll kind of do it that way. So I like that even better. So we'll kind of do it like that. So we have the black and the red and the two long. We have the three long. This is the older one. This is the newer one. From there, it goes to four. Five, they had the same variant. This is the older part in black. And the newer sets will all have it in gray. And they're even changing up now where they're doing yellow and red. Yes, I have seen the yellow and red one. I've seen more yellow than I've seen red, though. So I have a little bit of a mixed feeling about that, but this is how I kind of learned it. Then you go to six, seven, eight. You have nine, 10, 12, 
and that's about it other than those few rear uh weird one-offs right there's a black one that was the original longest one yeah and then it's 32 long uh, it's used in 80 yeah and then when we went the through shuttles. when we certified essentially the newest ucs yoda it has a white one in there mm -hmm. um I'm not sure if it's longer. I believe it's the same It's that length. same cut, but it's a different color. Right. And, I mean, it's a newer mold and everything, so it looks fresher. So it's a cool part to get a lot of motion throughout a build. The problem with that one, when it's that long, it gets more elastic and fragile. So you yes. can't apply as much torque because it'll start to twist. Mm -hmm. And in some of the sets that I built, I've, I've managed to twist these and, and, and have broken them. So when you put too much force on them, the longer it is, the easier it is to bend. It yeah, I've back. seen some axles break and pins break. Um, I mean, I definitely have broken a few. I haven't done the advanced builds <laughs> and technique that you Maybe have. Maybe we'll do that. But... We'll see just how much force can a, a Lego element take. We'll do an axle test. We'll do a brick test. So we can do some fun stuff like that. So uh, on top of that with the pins, you have the three and a half. So this is not a standard. It's a three and a half. It's got a little kind of bushing where they've incorporated like the stud on the end of it. So if you wanted to take that, you could stick it into a, a brick or a beam and it'll kind of hold it there. So it's the purpose of that one. And then you have the four long with a stopper. So this one has actually a, a bushing built into it. So you could feed that through and it's not gonna fall out. Right, and it won't slide out. So whatever it's connected to, basically it won't pull it through. Exactly. And then there's the longer version. This one is nine long. Same thing. It's nine long with the with the stud at the back of it. And then there's some that are, uh, this one is a five and a half long. And this one has a full axle on one side of that stud. And then the uh, five on the five and a half on the other. It does have a little indentation. So if you're using a part like this, uh, you're not able to push whatever it may be all the way down. It kind of makes you, it forces you to use a half stud there. But the main where, place where you're going to see this one is like on an axle wheel. So you would feed this through a beam or a brick, and it's going to hold it together. And you put your wheel on the outside so it could spin. Right, and that'll rotate because that thing's rounded off towards exactly. the end. So, and then it's got that little like shelf or lip yeah. that'll ride against. So like in a simple build, this is just a little axle coupler. You might see something like this with some bricks on the outside of it holding it all together. And then they put the wheels on the outside. And this is very simple, but very effective and sturdy. So you put your wheels on the outside. They're not mm -hmm. going to come apart. They have nowhere to go. These are stuck in. Right. There. And then this here, which is uh, the axle joint. Two lengths. Mm -hmm. It's almost like a tube. Yep. Um, which got, actually, I don't even see that part there. So uh, you've got that one there. And then they have them in a three long as well. That three long with the whole mm -hmm. pinhole through it here. So you guys could see. And then they also make this part here for the pins. So instead of having an axle through it, you could have... Oh, yes. I don't have one of those on the table. Right you now. could have a pin through it. Mm -hmm. And they're used for a lot of different things. They come in a variety of colors, too. Yes, those ones come in a lot of colors. Cool. Have we had any questions or any comments on the feed so far? Nothing yet? All right. Well, we'll keep on kind of plowing through here. Let's talk about beams, and then we'll move over to gears. So with beams and bricks. So Technic brick is, from the top, it just looks like a standard brick. But on the side, it actually has the holes for the axles and the pins to run through. So you can create the motion that you're looking for. So they come in all the way down to a two and a one. So here's a standard one Technic brick. The two wides come in a few different variants. You have the center hole, an axle hole, and then you have a two hole. This is a really useful part when you have weird gear ratios going together. Yeah, now Lego needs to come out with the axle one for this. Yeah, so we have two axles. Mm, I don't know. It, they would have to see because that's not a lot of material there. And the, the purpose of this brick is to hold something steady. So it needs to be pretty strong. I'm wondering if they did two of those. This piece in the middle would be too fragile and would crack. When crack in the it. center. Yeah. So you may just have to offset a little bit, you know, use a jumper plate to be able to offset if that was what you had. Yeah, you could on. do it that way too. And then from there, it goes up by twos. So you have twos, sixes, eights. I just brought a different, a bunch of two, or uh, fours, six, eight, 10, 12, 14, 16. So this is the longest that they make in that particular brick. Yeah, and what's great about these here is that when it comes to a lot of mocks, Technic beams such as these or these here 
allow you to build like an interior structure to hold weight and walls and all sorts of things yeah. together. These things are strong and they incorporate easily into a standard Lego build. Right. So for the longest time, it was this. Every Technic set came with these guys. And then around the mid to late 90s, they started to introduce beams. So a beam is here. Yeah, it's just like that. So a beam, as far as the lining up, they do line up exactly the same. But everything is it's, there. It's like a cutout, essentially. But there's no studs on it. And that gives you some advantages in being able to fit things very close together. So if you needed to, you could fit things, boom, right there, really close together. And that's something you can't do with the with the studs. Right, because you got this whole space mm -hmm. here, given that this is a brick. So, and that's another reason too why this hole technically is not centered in this Correct. design too. So there you have um, a good lineup between things, and then the stud and ratio is still. Yep, exactly. So I thought I'd try to throw out a few tips and tricks and like my rules to live by for Technic as we're going through. So uh, I think number one is definitely know your pins. Know what you're putting in and what the purpose is. Where it's friction it or friction. If you wanted something to move, make sure you use the right one. Because if you're building something super complicated like this eight-speed transmission and you use the wrong pieces, it's not going to work. Right. And, I mean, you have this here all set up. I mean, rotate just a few different things, and you guys could see all the There's gears and motion in this. Of that build. But if I was to use the wrong pin in the wrong place, I'm going to be introducing friction and things are not going to work right. very well. So make sure you're using the right pins. Number two, Lego is even. Technic is odd. So your builds and Technic are, for the most part, going to be lining up in a odd. One, three, five, seven, nine, eleven, thirteen, fifteen. Well, they go, I don't think there's a lot of 11s because for the... 11. <laughs> so that's the main reason I think that they switched because all of these things need to line up in a particular way. Right. And there's very few things that you're going to build in Technic that are in a four or six or an eight. Right. Going to be lined up and it's the same way. thing when you're building with bricks. Notice how they don't have any five links bricks. Yeah, there is no five links brick. But the majority of Technic is in fives, is in sevens, odds. nines. Right. And when you measure out your builds, for the most part, they're going to add up to an odd number because you need that area in between the bricks to put the motion in, so to line up the gears. Right, and, and like another that. thing too, this is a really cool idea too, is you could take the beam and the brick and you could stud it together. Yep, and if you needed and to- And it holds all that grip. You could add in some pins on the top. Right. Where you're getting some more. So it's a, a cool way to incorporate different things. This is nothing that's something that Lego hasn't done, but you're more than welcome to do it. It works so out you could perfectly see fine and doesn't this is stress those pieces. A what one and a half length pin. And that's and a then this is pin. a yeah, studded pin. So you get those. Now obviously this one, this dark gray one, is gonna have more play than the stud one. The stud one's kind of... It doesn't want to turn, right? Yeah, it doesn't yeah. want to turn. So it's cool that you guys can see all the different variants and how it really pulls together and doesn't pull together. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to show off uh, one thing here real quick. When you are working with Lego traditional builds and a Technic build, a lot of times you're going to need to incorporate the beams with the bricks and putting those together. What's going to help you out with that is kind of knowing the distances. I made up this little mock. This is, I'll show you what I use this for later. But as you notice, all of these are right next to each other. And it's very different than with this. So if we took a look here and we kind of tried to line up the holes, if I line up the holes at the bottom, look what's going to happen with the next row. There's no space. It doesn't, they don't line up. They don't line up, don't line right. up. Right. Because the beams all are all the way up until there. Okay. So whenever you're wanting to incorporate your bricks and your beams together, the trick is two. So the difference in the measurement is two. So if you wanted to take a couple of bricks and you needed to attach a beam to them, going perpendicular to them, mm -hmm. the trick is two. So two plates, add it in, will give you the right geometry where now you can add in your beam right. very easily. And it also allows you to use this center hole here for another advantage. Yep. So say you needed to have a, um, an area of motion. That's where you would have wanted that to mm -hmm. go in. Because these 
are connected together as this hole here in this axle that's free. So it's all holding, it's all held together, but then you have different. Yeah. And you would use pins, uh, yeah. uh, you know, correctly. So you do, you want to use your black pins. Right. So that's kind of the rule of thumb when you're incorporating those two different systems together between the bricks and the beams, you're going to want to add two plates. Three plates is two, uh, is uh, three plates is a brick. So that's going to be offset. So right. Sure and this is good for plates. a lot of like, um, interior structures too. Mm -hmm. So kind of like when you see houses being built on TV or in real life, this is kind of the same example is they'll use these beams and then they'll use the bricks with the holes in it and then they'll separate in different lengths and stuff. So you can get the right ratio and measurements, but then, you know, you put stuff together such as what Joe's doing right now is you get a nice structure, a box, yeah. cylinder, whatever shape you want, and it's held together pretty well because you're using the beams. But then you a also... lot of, you can have a lot of force applied down, so it's right. very strong in that direction. And because these are together, say you went even further up, you could add even more rigidity this way. It does not add a lot of rigidity this way. Right. This is the, this is the weak point. And that's where you would double up like on the inside here. Yes, or yeah, to kind of going this direction as well. Mm -hmm. So you do the same thing on both sides. That would give you rigidity left and right and locking your builds together. Right. So, I mean, Technic pieces can be used in so many different ways. And that's why um, I think I've said it to Joe too. These are, these are like the bones of Lego. Mm -hmm. This is what really keeps things together in all different ways. Yep. I mean, and they incorporate well. Yeah. You can stack bricks all you want. But if you really want to lock things in and keep a strength together so nothing breaks if it falls off a shelf or something, Technic bricks and beams, you know, studded or not studded pins or axles. I yep. So, I mean, just think about the parts usage, too. We've cut down on so many parts because how many bricks, if we needed something up here, how many bricks would you have to add in? We'd have to keep adding bricks and adding more bricks. Right. Whereas in this case, I've got all the way up there in one part. And I can, and I even have longer of this. Right. Version. So you're using, you're, you're using, using half parts. as less bricks, mm -hmm. and you're only using like one, correct, one third technique. Yeah. So the parts, parts usage goes down, the weight goes down, but the rigidity stays up. Mm -hmm. So that's where you want to, you know, kind of smarter, not harder type of work. So that's what the, that's why I really enjoy Technic so much is that it's you're really trying to figure out what is the fewest number of parts I can use to make up what it is that I'm trying to achieve. And how strong you could make it exactly. too, because I mean, you know, if you're just, brick, you're just putting bricking some something together. Other, they're, they've got some clutch power, but they're not gonna yeah. be able to do everything. But Rule three, yeah, we're gonna get to them. I've got a lot of them. Yeah, so you can have it like this, but look how easily these come apart. So I'm gonna take this guy apart and then we'll talk about the rest of our Ooh. beams. So we talked about bricks, they come in one, two, and then evens. Right. Beams, they come in, in one beam, which essentially is just like half of this thing. You have twos, which I have over here. They come in two variants. So they come in a standard beam and they come in an axle beam. And this is really useful because say you needed rotation, there's no way to really like rotate that around. Whereas with this one, with the axle, now you can add your mm -hmm. rotation. Into and that's it. where this kind of fun thing comes in, this little engine you got here. Yeah, show that off a little As bit. you can see how those are two lengths, one axle, which is the center, and then all these have holes. So this is a nice little engine mock. So as these rotate, you can see all the pins rolling through. And then Joe is telling me that like this is free just, just there, and you can yeah, add a chain. Could, we could figure out what the ratio is and the spacing to figure out what gear we need to line mm -hmm. up with that. But it's just kind of on there, kind of pretending to be like an alternator. Needs a needs a rubber band around it or something. Yeah. So very cool. And then for I'm um, there, there are also half beams. And that's really useful because there's also half gears and half stuff. Right. So these are like the bones and then mm -hmm. these are like the ligaments essentially. Yeah. So it takes two of these. These are different than Lego in that, you know, it takes three plates to make a brick. These are halves. Right. So to get your offsets, sometimes you need a half. So say something like this little bevel gear, it's a half as well. So if you're in there engaging with something, you need a little bit more holding that together. You could do that and still fit it within two studs mm -hmm. as opposed to it being a two and a half stud. And then it gets weird and your math gets all kind of wonky. Right. So there's not a lot of parts that are in halves. There's definitely a lot more a math mm -hmm. uh, when it comes to technics than there are basic regular brick. 
So those are your, you know, kind of half beams. They come in twos. I don't have any on the table, but you know, essentially it's two axles and a half beam. Threes, fours, four with a full. So this one's a little bit different than this guy. This one has an extra long bush, so you could apply a lot more force to that. It's got a lot more friction holding that together. They come in fives, sixes, and sevens. So I don't have any of fives. The fives come in two versions. There's one with axle pins on the end and one that's got all regular pins throughout. Yes. So those are really useful. Uh, they add a lot. They give you the ability to add a lot of complexity to your builds. And you could do a lot of things that you would not be able to do. If, or you could do, but it would just get so huge. Because if you're adding in all these halves over time, it gets a lot more going on. And then the last part for the beams are the bent beams. So these are this the is L bracket. These are essentially like one of my favorite parts here. You have the two by four, you have the three by five, you have the three by three perpendicular, and then you have a series of bent beams like these guys. And these are kind of all nomenclatured by the degree of their angle. Uh, but a lot of people just refer to them by how many pins there are. So this is a three by seven. This is a four by six. Uh, and Joe, isn't there another name six. for that besides beams? Isn't, aren't, there, aren't they uh, also referred to as lift arms? Yeah, arms, yeah. So whenever they're bent this direction, any type of bent in them. And uh, this is one of my favorite parts, and I'll tell you why. Because of that right there. Just having that incorporation to be able to have motion running through it, but then also to lock it if you needed something to rotate. Right. Very, very useful. And you can incorporate it with your axles to really kind of add rigidity you know, I can't think of how many times I've done a build where I needed to offset something like this. And now I've already got like my standard width and then I can start coming back in with my beams and that'll give me the ability to kind of do that. And then I'm off so that way I can run some things through it and connect everything together. So that's a really useful part. Anytime you see these, pick them up. Every color, they come in a ton of colors, but very, very useful piece. Then you have your three by five. So this one gives you some more elevation. You'll see that used in quite a few of the builds that we have over here. And then the perpendicular bent is really nice to use with uh, the motors. And we'll talk about those more, but they line up really nice with the motors and it gives you somewhere to anchor it down. So mm -hmm. very, very useful. Uh, pinned in essentially. Exactly, because you can't just let it hang out there spinning. It'll, it'll mess everything up. Mm -hmm. All right, so that kind of takes us through the majority of the beams. Uh, there's a few different variants and things like that, but that's the majority of what you're going to be building with. All right. Want to talk about gears for a little bit? Yeah, let's go into gears. All um, right, so we'll move these over. Do you want to incorporate your rule three with that as well? Hmm. The two, let's see, what was rule number one? That's what we got to talk about. Rule number one, know your pins. pins. Know your pins. That is a very good one. Rule number two? That is right. And then really rule number three should be the how to incorporate the two. So right. two plates, adding the two plates together to get your offset. So you get two bricks and then you get two thirds of another brick. Mm -hmm. So the beams come in halves, the, the Technic part or the Lego parts come in thirds. <laughs> Unless you get one of those Tyco pieces mixed in with your sets. Those ones will throw you off. Yes, Tycho, Tycho is, uh, is a very interesting <laughs> thing to do. So um, if you guys don't know about uh, old school, like 90s Lego, yeah. um, it was right around the time when Lego's patent ran out. Mm -hmm. And Tycho was, I think, the first person to jump on it. And they made almost an exact replica of the Lego brick. But the only difference was the plates were a half of a brick in height, not a third like Lego. So if you were building with both, as we did oh, as kids, just mess you up. And got, we had some very curvy walls. <laughs> right, you got all these like separations. <laughs> so realistically, what it would look like is you'd have it like this. If you guys want to see this, don't look at my face, but you could see it. It's like this lining up. It's so off. So you got that like staircase kind of representation. All right, I'm lining up some gears here. So this is the majority. I think this is every gear minus one. Yeah, I think there's one. There's a couple of new ones that just recently came out that I have, but they're currently in my Lieberman. They're in the build, so I have not gotten them taken out of the build. So there we go. And the variants of both. I think we got all. Oh, we need that guy. You need to go here. You need that you one. You need to go here. Uh, You're a duplicate. You're a duplicate. Oh, and right. these two weirdos. All right, these Perfect. are all duplicates. All right, so this is the majority of the gears that you're going to use. Okay. 
got another color color variant here. We'll do we'll do it like on top because that's the same thing, different color. Mm -hmm. That's my one of my weird ones from a Bionicle set, I think. All right, so let's talk a little bit about this. You have the smallest gear, which is eight tooth, and that refers to how many teeth go around the circle. A gear essentially is like a lever. Uh, if you've ever had to use a lever, you can lift a lot more weight by using the short end of the lever under the heavy part and then give yourself a really big lever on the other end of the fulcrum and you can amplify your weight. Gears are the same thing, except instead of it being just in one stick, it's a lot of sticks all meshed together and that's what those teeth are and that's how they work together. Right, so if you've ever seen an inside of a watch or a clock, a lot of old style stuff uses a lot of gears mm -hmm. to rotate both the hands when they need to be rotated along with the ticking sounds and any other functions. Yep. And then um, over time they incorporate like where you could put like the calendar date in your watches and stuff too. So those gears. It's all mechanical. Mm -hmm. It's all run off of gears. So knowing how many teeth the gear has versus the next gear next to it you can figure out that ratio and you can right. get all kinds of craziness going on. How many rotations you can get in from one gear if it's small to one gear if it's big. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So let's kind of run through them and then we'll kind of show you how you use those and incorporate them into your build. So you have the eight tooth gear. This is the oldest version. Then they updated it to this guy here. It's a little bit uh, a little bit nicer. It's thicker. It's thicker. The it's gears got some cuts in it. These guys tended to strip off quite a bit, but these ones will lock in really strong. Right. And then there's this version as well. The only difference between these two is this one is able to move freely up and down a beam, uh, an axle. So if you had something like this and you needed some motion in two de two degrees, look at how easy that one will move. Right, through. because it only has two little notches inside right. of it. Whereas this guy, like you get it on there and like he's on there. Whereas this guy, he's just, he just falls off. So this is a little bit rare part, not in too many sets, but very useful when you have a lot of motion that you're trying to achieve. All right, so that was eight. From there, we move on to 12. So you have your standard 12 bevel gears. These are straight gears. These are bevel. They're beveled because they have a the little bit of rounding on the edge. Mm -hmm. And that way you can line them up in different degrees, in different angles. So it helps out. Right, so it's kind of like this. Yep. You can see it. And then there's some old parts that Lego even made a gear that was like a it's double like bevel, that. rounded, exactly. And then you could also go perpendicular to each other. Right. Whereas if you can, uh, cannot do that with the straight cut gears, it just will not match. Right. They're not going to stand up well if you free it like this. Or So you got your double bevel gear. Then you have your single bevel gear. And then these are the really old ones. I just wanted to kind of show you the difference. You're not going to see these in any new sets, but they're very fragile. They break very easily. So if you apply a lot of torque, a lot of force onto the older ones, they'll the teeth will just shear. They are cool off. looking, though. It's definitely... This kind of piece here, um, like Joe said, they'll break easier, but this is a really good part for if you're trying to get some um, detail work in or uh, yeah, greebling, I guess of an you could say. Piece, that's yeah, probably a better application. Yeah, greebling would be cool. So this is really cool to have if you just want some detail work. It's probably not best to use in incorporating. Yeah, this. unless you got something really simple, not a lot of weight, not right. a lot of stress on the parts. Mm -hmm. Just use these. Ones. Use those. <laughs> these ones are much stronger. They can take a lot. Kind of how there are in this. You want to talk about the differential a little bit? Yeah. So uh, Joe and I were talking about it a little bit. And what's cool about this, um, if you guys have ever seen how some cars have yeah, built. Yeah, it's called the third member in a car. It's in between the axles of the driven wheels. Yeah. So this wide angle part of it is going to be the one that rotates the most. And then if you incorporate other parts... You could see eventually what will happen. Let's see. Uh, nope. No, other way. Other way? Yep. And then you're going to want to put Feed it in. Yep. That guy in there. So you incorporate this. This is that bevel gear he was talking about, which is a lot wider. Ooh. Incorporate that in. And so what will happen is this will rotate as you're turning this one. But then if you want to create a different type of motion... Right. It allows these to spin independently. So like in a vehicle, as it's going around a corner, the outside wheel has to go further than the inside wheel. And right. This allows the difference, differential, to have to take place. Mm -hmm. So then there was another way to do it, too. Um, you had a pin, right? So Yeah. You want to you show a little bit more? Yeah. All right. So, so let's way. say this is how it's meant to be used. Power goes in here, comes out there. And then these would be applied to the wheels, right, as it's going around. 
the wheels spin. If you can tell, they kind of spin opposite of each other. Here, we'll put some parts on there so you can kind of see what we got going on. So as I spin the power in, they're going together. But say this one can't go quite as far and it's obstructed, then it will push even more power to the other side. Which is where these inner gears here mm -hmm. that are in this frame allow a different cycle to go through. Yep. So you can use a differential as well to do some weird stuff that it's not intended to do, but works out really great. So let's say we take this guy and let's put something like that together and then we'll plug in just a simple simple pin, pin to lock it yeah so let's say that we wanted something to move before something else moved we could apply the force here and it's going to force it through the system so once once it can't move anymore then it's going to force it through the rest and it's counter rotation but say i wanted this one to go first what i could do is i can incorporate a clutch gear and kind of lock it in with a friction pin and an eight tooth. Do you want to talk about how the clutch gear works? Yeah, so the clutch gear is not directly, the center is not directly attached to the teeth. Whereas in a regular 24 tooth, like it's one solid chunk. What is inside of here are some discs that rub against each other and they introduce friction. So they will spin with each other until that friction or the force overrides that friction and then it will force, force it to go. So in this setup, you kind of see what's going to happen. So before, this one would spin and then this one would spin. I'm applying a force to stop it from spinning here. So what do you think is going to happen when I turn this right. way? So when you turn that, that part is going to lock in. Mm -hmm. And then so this the, one will, will the move. inner gears are going to start rotating that other one. What happens once this gets around and it can't turn anymore? Then the outside one then will start one will. moving. So let's give it a shot. So I'm going to turn it and nothing's happening see nothing's happening right here. but then once i get to the point where this is locked together now it's going to allow that to turn and it's got a little bit of friction it's a little harder to turn mm -hmm. but say you wanted a door you wanted to build a door that moved in and then opened you could use a mechanism like this which is cool which is kind of funny because one of our lug members mm -hmm. as joe and i are heads of our lug group our universal lug group one of our lug members created this door so it opens in and then it opens and he, he didn't use necessarily that gear but he used that same principle like i need two different areas of motion yeah and so i was telling him we got to do that on a bigger scale a big old monster door bigger scale <laughs> like you're walking into a dungeon or something so this one has three bevel gears on the inside, and then this on the outside is the same as a 22 that they mesh together. It's actually 1 to 1 1.6. So don't quote me on what that outside tooth count is on that one. But it ends up being 1 to 1 1.6 by the end because the inside is 1 to 1. Every ratio in there is 1 to 1. So what I mean by that is this is a 1 to 1. It's 16 teeth versus 16 teeth. This is 1 to 1. But whenever I line up something different like 8 and 24, it's a third. So for every one turn of uh, one turn of this, this goes a third of the way. So it's got to spin three times to make this one go once right. all the way around. Therefore, so Joe, would that mean that the bigger gear at that point is going to be running slower or faster than the smaller? Ooh, gear? do we have anybody in the comments that can answer the question? I'll give them a few seconds here. Which one of these has to spin faster to keep up with the other one? Kind of like wheels. If you got two different size wheels on your car. You got to make sure that they're not on the same axle or you're going to burn everything out, right? They got to be the same size on the axle. Right. So, so you could look at it. You could look at it this way too. Yep. So when you turn this wheel, what's going to, this one going to go faster or slower versus the other way around. If I turn this one, is this one going to go faster? Can anybody answer this in the comments? Which one's going to go quicker? No. Everybody's being quiet. Well, it's okay. So, you would rotate these because this is more surface to be covered. Eventually, this one is going to spin faster. Way faster, yeah. Because this is distributing it all the way down, essentially, to the lower gears. Well, think about it this way. This guy has to do a lot more movement Running. than this guy, right? Right. He's got to go a lot further. It's kind of like if you're spinning around in your office chair. If you, if you have your arms out, you go slow. You pull your arms in, you go faster. Nobody right. spins their arms in an office. <laughs> because there's no, about, because there's no resistance, essentially. <laughs> exactly. So, as you can see, if I rotate it, you see how fast the little is going to the big one. 
And we'll kind of build a little mechanism and I'll show off a, a transmission that kind of shows you the, the mechanism and how that works together. Yeah. All right. So a couple more things on the gears. You do have the old style. You'll see this in some of the old builds. This is a 24 tooth bevel gear because they hadn't come up with these guys yet. Uh, but this, this kind of made this out of date. <laughs> it was good because this was really the only way to get perpendicular motion before they had bevel gears. So that's a good part to have. You have your clutch gear. And then you get a couple of bigger ones, 36 and 40. So your biggest ratio that you can have. And I is, think this is the biggest gear, right? Or isn't there one more? There's some not common. In the really old Lego, there is like in the 70s. But in any modern stuff, this is going to be the biggest. Technically, there would be one more that could be considered a gear, which mm -hmm. would be on the, uh, was it the Hellfire Droid? Yes, so Star that Wars. one does technically very, have gear very large. rings on the inside of it. Yeah, the wheels for that, and mm -hmm. it was used in an X04 set as well. Uh, I think that one's got 140 something, 120 something teeth on it. So that would be like monster. You could do that. And oh yeah, you're RC. talking about the big green one. Yeah, yeah there's the big green ones, and then right. the Hellfire Droid had those. I've remote controlled my Hellfire Droid by just putting motors on it. So mm -hmm. it, it does work. It's it's a little torquey and it's got a lot. I'm of sorry, it's Hellfire Droid. Hellfire Droid. <laughs> Um, but, uh, a couple of more things. We got the 36. This is your biggest ratio. It's kind of like five to one. So that one's pretty, pretty crazy. So that little one is going to spin a lot. Yeah, this one has to, to spin that. a lot. And that's why we show the differences. It's, it's got to go, it's got to go all the way around, turning and turning and turning and turning and turning. Whereas mm -hmm. if you spin this one, that little guy is going to spin. So it's kind of like, it's kind of like if like a person was running on a boulder because the boulder is covering more surface area, the person on the boulder is going to be running so yep. much, a lot more steps. Yeah. And I mean, as compared to a man running on the earth, imagine you were standing still and you were trying to use the earth right. treadmill. It'd take you forever. Right. And even <laughs> if you're a taller person, you're still going to be taking more steps regardless of the surface you're on. Perfect. And then there's a few variants on the 16. These are the old ones. These ones were prone to cracking. See how they don't have the interior, whereas they reinforced it here in the newer ones. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. I think this is my first time seeing this one. And then the importance of these are these here have the ability to engage and disengage with our drive rings. So they have some teeth built into it. I'm going to turn that one over. So you guys have probably seen, you know, Star Wars uses this part quite a bit in a lot of their builds, but its original purpose was as a drive ring so you could engage and disengage and that's what we use in the transmissions all the lego transmissions is these parts right here so this is an older version that's too wide um but then lego realized hey uh we should use an odd number in our tech build and they came out with a three wide drive ring so this one allows this mechanism to kind of here we'll put one together real quick it allows this to spin on its own until it's engaged and now they're locked together and it won't spin and that's kind of where this one comes in, that's right? Where that one comes in. So this is a four-speed transmission that has a, a sequential shifter built into it. So this is a lot more complex. Uh, this is something I'd be more than happy to show you guys on a future build. If you want to build yourself a car that's got a four-speed transmission, uh, you don't have to build it exactly the same way. The center part is the transmission. This on the outside, those are kind of rare parts out of some newer sets. But that's used to shift the gears. So there's a, a piece that comes with these that you can use to shift the gears, or you can simply just use a beam as well. Yeah, this orange one here where you could run an axle through is cool because it it's got this whole like wavy it's got, motion it's to got it. It's a sine wave to it. And by by here, I'm gonna go this way. So these have ups and downs on you know every 90 right. degrees. So by offsetting these, you can make sure that only one gear is engaged. It's switching. Mm-hmm. But the transmission works very simply. This is our kind of input gear. It's coming in and spinning the smallest gear possible. And it's meshed up with a three to one. And on the back side, you've got a 16 to 20. Right. So in this transmission, you have four speeds going from five to one all the way to one to one. So if you need to add more horsepower, you can only do so much with the Lego motors, right? It's kind of like when you're shifting gears. You're shifting gears. So this allows you to kind of shift those gears. Say you need to go up really slow, but you needed to go high, like you've got a lot of force to go high, you'd use a lower gear. So the motor is spinning more, and it's the transmission is going to amplify that torque. So you don't go as far, but you have more power. 
Then so you got more get, force on mm -hmm. each step you take. But if you need to go faster, you need more of the revolutions of the motor getting to the wheels. So you would gear up, and so that lowers the ratio. The further apart the ratio, the slower, but the more force. It's kind of like the lever, right? If I'm trying to lift something heavy, and I uh, I I I, get, I got something heavy, and I'm just got a little bit over here, it's it's harder to lift. Whereas if it's over here, I can lift it really easy. So it's that fulcrum idea. So this is a pretty simple build. It, it, if you know what's going on here, it uses this simple parts and gears. Maybe this is something we could all build together and put that out there and so people can kind of see how it works. Or even just a little two-speed so they can kind of get the... Yeah, I think we there. were discussing a two-speed and then people could go from there. Yep. So we'll show them how that kind of goes together. And then when you want to shift the gears, just turn this. And now it's going to spin faster and faster and faster all the way up. So the one downside of this mechanism is it doesn't have a neutral. So, but it's not a gas engine. It doesn't have to continually rotate its right, it's right. It can so stop or go. Not a hundred percent accurate to real life, but same principles are involved in that. All right, we talked about a lot of stuff. Hmm. How about we do some suspension stuff, and then we'll talk about the motors. That sound good? Yeah, and then I think we'll end it on there, and then we'll. All right. So we'll talk a little bit about the suspension. So everybody likes suspension springs, right? So this is where you'd have a wheel in your car and you'd kind of go in and you could use this spring to like getting it over a bump or something. There's a few different versions. Yeah. So these are the oldest style. They're kind of easy, easy going. Doesn't take a lot of force to push them down. There's a newer version, which has got a harder spring. Look at the number of springs that are in there. So push down that one compared to the old one. Right. So if you guys can see. <laughs> So it takes a lot more force to push the yellow one down. Right. And in a lot of the new Technic builds, they'll actually use like a couple of these. So that way it's nice and compact, but it can handle the weight because there's some of those models are very, very large. And, and then, then they have two bigger ones. Yeah, these are the bigger ones. So the difference between these is the same as those between a hard spring and a soft spring. So it's got the same way it's all put together. But this one is really simple. This one's God, it takes a lot more. So you get more bounce out of the black one. You get one. more bounce out of it, but if your build is too heavy, it's just going to boom, just going to yes. fall to the ground. So that's where you got to get This one, there's more pressure, yep. therefore you could hold more up. So here's an, a, a quick little example of how I use those. Uh, this is a what would be referred to in your vehicle as a McPherson strut because the strut is attached to the hub and holds it together. Um, but this is what would attach to your body of your car up here. Uh, you'd use a part kind of like this. You'd have that guy there, and then you would put that together. So that's kind of held in there. Then you'd have your drive wheel. Right. Where you could use and a lot of these other parts and stuff joint. we can get to in another segment. Yeah. So this is how you would be able to turn your wheel, and then you'd also have suspension, and you'd have drive. So this is like very simple. Every Ford Fiesta or Escort, <laughs> Hyundai, <laughs> Honda, they all have a McPherson strut. Uh, it's just very simple, very easy to use. Um, Here's another mock-up of one that's kind of got some more going on with it. So it's got the, the bottom arm, the top arm, and then this is a super duty CB joint. So the uh, the CB joints allow for you to kind of have some bend when you're building. Also, also with rotation. With And rotation. But if they can't, they can only hold so much force. So building one like this, now you've got, you know, a whole lot, and you can move it up and down, and you can really crank so it. So you really can get over yeah, stuff. So if you had a giant model, say something with some big old honking wheels on it, You'd want to build your own CB joint to make it really strong. Kind of what you were talking about with Boone on his stream for mm -hmm. Brick World is like making a big vehicle that could really go from yeah, point big vehicle, end. something really fast. We'd need a transmission. Um, if we're going to use electric motors, and we'll kind of talk about the electric motors here to wrap it up. So uh, they only apply so much force because they have a limited amount of power. So I'm going to take this off. Limited power. Limited power. I'm going to show you the old stuff. Just so you know, hey, mom, I learned about something from when you were a kid. <laughs> um, and then I'll show you the newer power functions, and we'll go from there. So older version motor is six AA batteries, so it is nine volts. It's a very simple plug. It just attaches in one of two ways. You can turn it this way or perpendicular. And you had on and off, forward, backward. That's all you got. Now, these guys here, they spin kind of fast but they're easy to stop. So this one's a little bit better than this guy here. I'll show you this guy real quick. 
This guy here spins the fastest, but has no power. So on this one, you have to gear it. That thing's humming, right? Wow. But touch it. You can stop it. You hear it. that? Right. Because it's spinning so it's spinning fast. too fast. So on this so, one, you So that would definitely be a speed motor, not a torque motor. Yeah. So you could put <laughs> make something really light, put this in, it'll go fast. But if you add a lot of weight, man, nah, it isn't going to move at all. Can't overcome it. So this is the older. Then there was an interim. So we went from this type of connection over to power functions, where we have something like this guy here. So these are a different type of plug, proprietary to Lego. They did make an extension where you could incorporate. So this plug goes to here, and then you can use a newer motor. Like this is a, uh, not a motor, sorry, it's not a motor. This that is a motor. One, there we go, the, motor. the small motor, the M motor, as most people call it. And then you can get something like this in. Yep. Boom. Well, you know what? I'm going to do it this way. I don't know. We have batteries in this one. I mean, I have batteries in this one. Here it is. This is the one we want. This <laughs> one's got the goodies. All right. So we'll trade it out, swap it, plug it in. Now you guys can see how this works. There you go. And then, as he said. So that's the smallest. From there, you move up one. We'll kind of put a – here, let's do this. Let's put just some pieces on there so they can kind of compare how things are. How working. much is spinning? Yeah, I think that will help them visualize a little bit. So okay. you get that one and that one, and I'll build you one more. So this is the XL motor. This one spins slow, but it has the most power as far as torque. So, so they'll be able to move. see all three movements. Yeah, so this one can move the most weight the easiest. So we'll put one of those on there. Yeah, there we go. So let's go top, middle, and bottom. And kind of see the difference. So this one spins the fastest. This one's in the middle. This one's the slowest. But as far as power, the big one has the most power. It can move the most weight. These one can make things probably go faster. Now, Joe, you're running all three of those simultaneously in that power functions box, correct? What's that? You're running all three of those stacked? Yeah, I just have them stack? all stacked there together on the power functions box. Another thing, uh, they made the train motors. If you guys ever have any of the trains, it's very, very similar. It's just a, it's essentially this motor turned sideways inside of here, if you didn't know that. It's got the same type of plug. And then there's the infrared receiver. So what this would do is rather than it being like that, we could take all of those and attach them here. And we can apply the power here and turn that on. I'm on the red channel one. So I can take my infrared red channel one and point it at it. And now I can proportionally control the speed. So if I want to go forward, stop, backward, really slow, forward. What would be a good uh, use of that? So if you were like in the transmission, this is a great way. So you may have one motor that's plugged in and it's going as fast as it can, but you would use something like this to change the gears because you want to control how much the gears change. So that would be a good use of that. These are on in every train set because if you just had on and off, the train would either go full speed or nothing. So this one allows you to go faster and slower, stop and turn around. And this one is able to control four infrared units at a time. So you have channels one through four, and then each channel is broken into two. So you have the red and the blue. Right. And then this one's got um, reverse studs on here, the anti studs. Yeah, so that one's the only one that's got the reverse studs. All the others right. have to be incorporated with, with your, some kind of technic yep. base. And what I find to be the easiest is this piece right here will give you a lot of all the leverage. Yep. So that way you can have it plug in together, put some pins there, and then you can attach this up at the top with your beam and use a couple of like perpendiculars. So right. And this here is together. six lengths. Mm -hmm. So you got a nice. Nice amount of surface area you yep. can cover with that. That one's one stud longer, and then these are the one stud shorter, so kind of in the in the size range. So that way you could see the ratio between those as well. So how you can though you could see how those can be incorporated in a build. And then there, the XL is five wide, the others are three wide. So this is my go-to motor. This is the one I like. It's just kind of in the middle. It works the best. This one's the most common in sets. Right. So you end up using a lot of those. Uh, but that one does you know, a lot of speed, so you got to gear it down. Make sure you're always gearing it down when you're putting things together. And then there's and then there's the Bluetooth versions too. Now we'll get into the newer stuff a little bit later with the Control Plus, uh, powered up 2.0, which I actually NXT, just saw. I, right. all I actually just saw that that was getting a big update as well too. Yeah, so that'll be hey, good. Hey Joe, so before we close the show for today, uh, you had a little rig to figure out 
gearing. You want to show that off? Yeah. To, so, to help everybody else that's trying to figure it out at home. So we spent a good time talking about gearing. I made up this quick and easy little rig. Which essentially, is just a lot of one by nines, nine across, and all held together on the back side. And this is something that I came up with a while ago that really helped me out on trying to figure out my spacing for the gears. Um, so if you need to put something together and it's in a weird position, sometimes it's hard to look at it and figure out what you need to do. But with this rig, say you needed to get something that had motion here to attach them something motion on this end. Imagine it being on the top. Right. This will give you the ability to figure out where can I put something that will actually line up. So if I take this gear, it's not going to work in that position. It's not going to work there. It's not going to work there. But as a, you can use this to kind of hunt, seek, and destroy and figure out what can I do to make it work. Where's the ratio? Yeah, where's the how ratio many at? How many holes away or studs away? Or if I you am? might need a different gear. <laughs> so this is a weird one, right? So this is me going 20 to 12. And the actual ratio is three over and one up. So this meshes up well. So I couldn't do it like that. And I couldn't do it like this. So it helps you to kind of line up and figure out. So this is a nice little cheat way that I came up with to be like, okay, how can I incorporate different ratios that maybe shouldn't normally go together? Right. And you said this is nine by nine. So if you guys want, you can make this bigger. Yeah, you um, can do a 15 by 15. Which obviously needed. would get give you the most space. Um, but nine by nine, I guess, is a pretty good baseline. You know, because it gives you a lot of space in between both corners. Yeah, the 9 by 9 gives you quite a bit of area to play with uh, to figure out yeah. ratios anyway. Yep, I think it works pretty good. It's something that I've used regularly. And then, you know, when you're kind of sitting down playing around, you're like, all right, I've got this. What are all my ratios that I can do that will actually work? Okay, that works there, but it doesn't work over here. Okay, so if I do that, then what is the 1 to 1 ratio? Okay, it's not there. It's not there. Um, okay, can I even do a one-to-one? -one? And you may be like, you know what? This is never going to work in this format. So I may have to switch over to bricks and plates. So maybe it's a, it's a brick and a plate off of each other. So then I could go back over here and be like, all right, it does work if I do something like this. Oh, okay. Then I can start playing around. With Reducing my... the space. Right. So this is a, a two, uh, two over two. It's two over one in a plate up. <laughs> So your math gets a little bit wonky, but it gives it's, you it's a lot more, of math. It it's, gives you some diversity and being able to do things together, right? So that's the majority of what we wanted to talk about today with Technic. Uh, I would like to hear some feedback from you guys. Uh, what you like? What would you like to see more of or less of? And then uh, what are some of the builds um, that we can build and put together and kind of show you how to do? Uh, I, I don't necessarily know because I haven't seen your creations. I haven't seen your mocks. So if you have an idea or something that you would like to incorporate into what you're building, send us a picture, send us some description and tell us what you'd like to do. And uh, we'd like to partner up with you between myself, David, or other members of the Universal Log. We'd like to help you out and see if we can find a way that would work out best for you and uh, help you guys continue to win. Yeah, so if you guys can get motion, right. Yeah. If you guys can get motion or would like motion into your mocks that you build at home, you know, this is a great way for you guys to learn on the different parts, ratios, etc., and allow you to be like, oh, you know what? Well, my build is, you know, this many bricks high. How much technic or gears can I incorporate in for some movement, you know? And if you're short on these kinds of parts, because they don't come in a lot of standard sets, um, there's some smaller Technic sets that I know that Ryan carries here in the store that have a really good mix. Uh, there's that Arcos tractor. I think it's a $10 or $15 set. And you get like three of these. You get two of those. Is that that little green yeah, one? you get two of those. You get one of these guys. You get a whole bunch of these. You get a lot of different stuff in that one little set that it's a fun set, but it's a really good part set you can pull from that to put into your other things. So don't think you have to do a huge investment. There's a lot of, of, of things sitting on this table that would take a, a long time to earn the money to have. Right. Um, or, or you can go on BrickLink and you could yeah. just order, you know, four of each part yeah, and go from there. So three of each part, however it works. There's a lot of diversity within each one of the Technic sets. So it's not the value in them is in the parts, not in the figs. That's, I'd say that's the major difference. So. But yeah. Awesome. So that is our intro today for our, what is it, Mox in Motion? Mox in Motion. We didn't do too much motion. 
Um, but hopefully we'll get some feedback of things that people are trying to make or want to see built. Right. And I'll even bring in some Technic sets that uh, show off all these elements used in different ways. And so you guys can get a look for that. We'll bring in uh, something where the transmission to go into. We may even bring in a an LPE motor and kind of show that off a little bit. Yeah, and that way we could talk about the different motors, the newer ones, the old ones, and then we can incorporate stuff into a build like the this. Big Mac Daddy transmission. Yeah. yeah. So you guys could see this all powered up and geared. <laughs> like, there's a lot going on with that. Yeah, thing. there's That's a lot a going cool. on with that one. It's got the, the shifter here. It shifts everything. It's actually two gearboxes meshed together. You got a high and a low. There's a lot of cool stuff going on with that one. So, well, I appreciate you guys. Uh, we'll keep you posted on when we're going to do the next episode. Give us some feedback. Let us know what you'd like to see done. And uh, that way we get some challenges and we can we can help out wherever possible and you know give us a chance to flex our, our strength and our might a little bit on some stuff. So appreciate your time today. Enjoy and uh, keep on building. We'll see you soon. Bye, guys. Have a good one. This has been a production of Mox in Motion by Bricks and Minifigs with Joe Dorsey. We will see you guys next time. Same BAM channel, same BAM time.